Welcome to our latest rebroadcast, podcast number 84. Know that everything will open. Isaiah 1 featuring Mike from COT. This episode originally aired on June 1st, 2024, exclusively on counciloftime.com. For more details, check the link in the description below. To gain deeper insights, visit the Council of Time's official website link below. We're dedicated to providing truth, hope, and support to those struggling with addiction and God's love and guidance. Your support helps us guide individuals towards truth, sobriety, and preparedness for the perilous times foretold in Scripture. Join our exclusive Locals community for EGP family members and enjoy early access to exciting content. Thank you for being an integral part of the End Generation Project's success. Before diving into today's rebroadcast podcast, episode 84, titled Know That Everything Will Open, Isaiah 1, we're excited to announce the rollout of new features on our YouTube channel. We're introducing Super Chat premieres and a new merch store directly on the End Generation Project channel. You can now purchase our latest designs on a variety of merch, from hoodies to limited edition prints and posters. Stay tuned for these exciting updates coming soon. Your support through these past months has been crucial. These new features will allow us to reach more people, offer more insightful episodes, and expand our mission. By shopping with us, you're not just getting great products, you're making a meaningful impact on our community. We couldn't have come this far without the support of all our Egg members and God's blessing. Visit our store now to explore our collection and help sustain our efforts. Thank you for your continued support and generosity. May the Lord your God keep you all, always. Enjoy the podcast. Blessings. I do apologize for that. That was an old wire, evidently, just like I am. And it would have to be the only one that's not... Uh, we still have a set of wires. Well, quite a few. Better not optic. Most of the wires that we have here are optic. Easy conversion, but it works a lot better when things are not, uh, you know, metal, zinc alloys, and so on and so forth. Most of the wires here are, they operate by light. It's quite the cheap trick, too, it is. You guys remember those old lamps with, uh, they had the fiber coming out of them? You guys remember that? The old lamps where you turn it on, they had the, uh, you know, if you broke them, you'd have that stuff all over the place. Well, I went and got one of those, right? And uh, I had a resin printer, a small, tiny little resin printer, and I adapted a fitting where you could join those together so light passes all the way through them. Those were wrapped in resin, right? A flex resin so they can bend. And um, all the wires now in, in Arduino, two Arduinos, they can run up to about two to 300 connections. And so those little Arduinos are about, no, no, $13. Uh, you program them. And so essentially, in any, any device, right, you plug it into the device, but as far as your line, your audio line, it's run by light. So basically, everything is fiber optics at, at a cost of about dollars. Not too bad. You just have to find one of those old lamps. That's all. So, but I have some that I did not convert because it's a very tedious job. But once you get them in place, they don't degrade. I think it's a wonderful thing, actually. All right, guys, I hope you guys are ready for the heat. Um, I, I certainly hope that... Uh, Everybody is ready for the heat, unfortunately. You know, you would think that cooler heads would prevail through what's happening. It's not. It's not. So I have to be blunt with you. I know that most people are for proof patterns. They really don't think about or they justify their aggression. I believe they understand. There is a deep spiritual darkness of the whole of the USA. It is embedding itself and as many as it can, causing the aggression factor to increase one towards the other. I mean, a sheer hatred. This is going to cause some of the greatest consequences this country has ever seen. You will notice in proportion to aggression, violence, anger, you're going to notice the conditions rapidly degrade here in the USA. 
That's what you'll notice. They're not changing either. You know, you would think after the weather phenomena, hearts would, you know, a, a person would look back to their brother and say, hey, look, I know we have issues in this area, but let's find something good for the people. You would think that would happen. No. People are separating much further than ever before. They are. And so now a worse thing is coming. For example, Texas is going to wish they had every drop of rain. They're going to wish they somehow could have saved it. Arizona likewise. In fact, all of the southern states are going to wish they could have saved every drop of rain. Mexico's inability to take a position in several areas, and I know you guys may not be familiar with politics of Mexico. They have a new president, of course, president-elect, Anna, who is a climate scientist, a Jewish president, female. I can only hope that uh, she would work very closely with the USA to start to push back some of these operatives that are utilizing Mexico. They have a compromise problem. Mexico is growing by leaps and bounds. Lots of money is pouring into Mexico, not from the USA. But this is due to favors. Favors, that should not be done. These are by no means humanitarian favors. These are tactical maneuvers, which is going to cause more friction, especially at the border. So get ready for a showdown at the border, but not like you think. Get ready for that. If people continue to treat people like garbage, consequences will be massive. See, we're supposed to be a mature race, correct? The human race. We're supposed to be mature. We would think we could find a solution, and we could. That would actually begin to work for everybody, and we could. The problem is, due to people who want money and others who want power, other people who want money and longevity with that money, they keep a certain percentage of garbage and trash going at the border. Campaigns, you may not know this, but there are campaigns that go out to different countries inviting people to come to Mexico so they can get inside the USA. There are campaigns. These campaigns, well, I'm not going to go too far on that. I have a big caution to me concerning that. But I'll tell you something, they're not from the USA. Now, if you do your homework, you'll find out what country is responsible for that. And it's not the USA. However, the USA is not taking steps to do all of what they can to stop these campaigns. In other words, they're killing people. If you tell a person from one country that they can come to your country just so they can get into another country, you're killing that person who's coming. You're going to kill the family of the person who's coming. Because they have to leave everything behind. It is unfair to the people who have been given false hopes that they can come in because they don't see the USA like you do. They see the USA as a breath they can exhale. A place where they don't have to fight every day and duck and dodge bullets every day. Most of these people come from broken homes. Their families are killed. And they're looking for a place where they can stay without the violence. These campaigns, they have to stop, and they're not coming from within the USA. But the USA has become too subservient to rhetoric and not the people. What I mean by that is a leader, any leader, an elected leader in the systems that we have, this republic operates by democracy. A democracy has leadership appointed to represent the people's voice. They speak for the people, and that's not what's happening. The leadership is speaking for a select group of people. They're not speaking the average sentiment of the whole of America. They're speaking for the 5% of these groups in America. They're not speaking for you. They will often say that they are, having not contacted you. Most of the people I've ever talked to in life have never had an answered request. In other words, they would request something of their leaders, receive nothing in return, some generic response. They're not speaking on their behalf. In fact, the sentiment of the people, the whole of the people, is not what's being spoken in these positions of leadership. Why? Because they're speaking for the 5%. So they take a group of people, demographic, and they get the top 
of that demographic that they believe should be that demographic, and that's who they work with. That's who they negotiate with. To be a representative of the people is not a negotiation. It's an execution of what the people actually want. The problem is education. Hear me on this. So if you had a city, and only 5% of that city is educated enough to be accepted as being those who can actually speak what they feel, they're only going to listen to that 5%. The 95%, they're not going to hear. Their requests are not going to be made, which is why you have so many disgruntled people in the USA. Because the representatives are not speaking for all the people. They're speaking for the 5% of each group. By the way, the 5% are not struggling in life. They're not. So it's almost like a lost cause. Because they're doing this, they're always going to be disconnected from large groups of people in the USA. Lately, I've been looking at preparations. Do you not know that only, 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 only 32%, 32 to 38% of the people in America have the ability to prepare for a catastrophe? What in the world is happening? Now, these numbers are coming, obviously, from the folks that are interacted with. Polling is taken. Some of the data from internet polling, there are oftentimes, I'll have a poll on the internet. I don't do it under any specific name. When people answer these questions, the responses are less than encouraging. They're not good. There is a huge disconnect in this country. In the meanwhile, leadership is becoming quite vile. Listen to me carefully and they're full of revenge. Do you guys understand what that means? When you start hearing that word revenge, you might want to make a life adjustment. You don't hear that word often, do you? But I want you to look at every single case where somebody has publicly made that statement and you tell me what has happened to that people. It is one of the Lord's commands to us, a command to leave vengeance alone. He commanded us not to touch it. He commanded us not to have it within us. He gave us a command. The creator of all things commanded us and told, he warned us. He said, vengeance is mine. You know that's a warning. I'll tell you this because I'm not biased. Didn't matter who it is. Anybody who seeks revenge and would tout that to any people, they're going to face public consequences, not by men, by everything they touch. The Lord has already told us what he would do when people seek out vengeance. And if that be the motive, the Lord will not help. That means the longer they continue on this track, well, it used to be anger has turned to evil of evil. Because now it seems they don't care to see the other person die. They don't care. People feel vindicated when somebody else, when they die. They don't care about the opposition in the White House. Do you really think these people, you know, they, they speak a lot of rhetoric. They use a lot of rhetorical devices in their speeches. And if you know about rhetorical devices, it's not a big deal. Because you understand the, their ideology, their main ideology. You understand the speech. You understand the game they're playing. We are in a new era. So when you hear a person say, I don't care what happens to that other person. And indeed, they die. I've seen it in their faces. They have become cold and callous, non-caring. What makes it worse is that you have a lot of the populace joining in that cold behavior. And now a worse thing must come. They're not, they're not seeing it. These things that come to pass, they're not coming to wake those up who side with evil, who love evil, no. But those who would follow someone into a dark place. See, there are some of you out there, and that's all they know. They think it's okay to seek revenge. They think it's okay to speak evil of your brother. They think it's okay to cast stones at the other person. They really do believe that's okay. And they do not care if the other person dies or lives. Because of that, darkness with them must be broken. Just as the Lord delivered to us when he caused us to be bitten by the darkness we held. 
they too must be bidden. See how that works? They too must be bidden. People may give up on you, but the Lord will not give up on you. People may have said, well, it's no, no use trying to, you know, get that person to see, but the Lord doesn't work that way. We live by his calendar. He does not live by ours. These are his times. These are not our times. We are his creation. He is not our creation. So when the heat comes and the fires consume, when the resources wane, when they start casting their personal power, what empowers them in the street, when they realize no one can help them out of what's coming, and maybe their hearts will be tender, then maybe sobriety will come, then maybe they'll consider. But be warned, there are many who will not consider. And the consequences will double as a result of it. You know what happens when you do something against your brother with hatred in your heart? It's called murder. In your father's eyes, it's called murder. Murder is an unlawful killing. Whoever sanctions murder. Now remember, you got to remember the principle. Can anybody make God angry? In the Bible, who had the power to make God angry? Anybody. Who had the power to make the living God angry? But the heathen make God angry. I never read that before. Never read where the heathen made God angry. I never read where King Nebuchadnezzar and his folks made God angry. I never read where sinners made God angry. Those who once followed him, those who recognized him, they're the ones who can make him angry. In order for someone to make you angry, right? Because you may not know this. In order to make someone angry, and, and, and hear me on this, God's anger is not like our anger. Our anger is formed out of a myriad of emotions and unresolved things that we don't know how to handle. It could have an underlying source of a great many things, but God's anger is pure. God's anger is a dissatisfaction. That's what God's anger is. Because he grants us freedom. He does not control what we do. He didn't control that. And so when his own children rebel against him, and they're about to kill themselves, listen to me, because if those who belong to the living God, if they follow his ways, they begin to enter into life. They live. Now, Father, who sees a good child, they're going to say in their own minds, that child is going to live. Because they're not out there doing the stupid things, the foolish things, the destructive things. They're not doing it. And they're going to live. But when that child rebels against his parent and say that's a good parent, who would only teach him ways of righteousness, when they rebel, that child begins to enter into death. So rebelliousness is to begin to die. Do you hear me? Now, no father wants their child to die. That dissatisfaction comes because the children begin to kill themselves. Now, any father who loves his own children is not going to be pleased when his own children willfully kill themselves. That's what rebellion is. Rebellion is when you murder yourself. Because as soon as you're not listening to the Most High, you enter into the ways of death. You start killing yourselves. You start dying. And that causes a great dissatisfaction within the father. That's his anger. And because anger has action behind it, there are very special consequences that come as a, as a result of that. Those who led them into anger, they, they don't have a hope. God gives time to repent, but he always sets a time of judgment. Always. For many years now, there have been people out there leading God's children astray. Telling them it's okay to do this and it's okay to do that. Man has not seen God's judgment in the earth. Not by way of a sentencing. They've not seen that. But they're about to. Because they refuse. They refuse to obey. They refuse to acknowledge him. After all of what's happening around the globe, they still refuse to acknowledge him. There's no great call to repentance. There's only prideful action taking place. There's only people saying that I made the right move and they're making the wrong move. That's all you hear. You don't hear anybody saying, Lord, forgive me. If I'm wrong, Lord, forgive me. I hope I'm not wrong. What happened to the people who seek? 
the higher ground as far as morality is concerned. The Bible says, blessed are the peacemakers. What happened to them? Where they at? You don't see them either. In fact, what you do see are the very characteristics, the opposite of what God said was blessed is what you're starting to see in the earth. And they are infecting the believers. They're causing you to have aggression. They're causing you to rebel. They're causing you to hope for the demise of somebody else. But now the Lord must demonstrate, because if he doesn't, what will turn a person away from their own mindset and your personal lives when you were going down that path of darkness and you thought it was okay? Did not the Lord cause a massive destruction in your life? Your life essentially broke apart. The losses were great, and it turned you around. It caused you to pay attention. He didn't force you to get saved. He made it so that you could see the truth. He made it so that you would understand that the wages of sin are death. But now in this day and age, we don't even hear that word much, do we? Sin. We don't hear that. Everything is adjusted to make inclusive the behaviors of the aggressive and the violent and those who teach hate and those who love hate. No one will be able to hide it. The Lord is bringing out something from within us. We knew it was coming. These situations in the world, I listen, I'm, I do not ever pat myself on the back. Please don't ever think that. But I'll tell you something when the Lord gives me, when the Lord gives me something, not when I just have a dream, but when he gives me something, I trust it 10 billion percent. And a long time ago, I shared a dream with you guys about a storm coming on an island, about the people that were there and what the Lord was doing. He's doing it now. He's causing what is within us to surface. I remember saying that when he does this, it's because he's going to uproot it forever. Now, that's for those who choose to obey him. For those who choose not to obey him, it will be their demise. Because if a person have a clean heart, if they truly have a clean heart, and anything surfaces out of their own hearts, they're going to say, no, I don't want this in me, Lord, take it away. They're going to ask the Father to take it away. How is it going to surface? Conditions of the world are going to bring that dark thing that's within you straight to the surface. That's what's happening right now. Now, for some, they're saying, I don't want this feeling. I shouldn't feel this way. This is wrong. I don't want this in me. I don't, I don't want this to be a part of me. And the Lord will uproot it. But for some, they're attempting to utilize it like a rally cry against all who would oppose them. Listen, darkness is coming out of people and they're utilizing it against all who oppose them. If a person have a little light in them and anything dark rise out of them, they're going to ask the Lord to take it away. But if a person truly be dark and something dark rise in them, they're going to utilize it against their enemies. That's the difference. That's why the Lord said, all hide yourselves, all ye meek of the earth who have wrought his judgment in the earth. The judgment of the living God. It will come because of the meek of the earth. Not because of the people who think they're Rambo. Because of the humble. Because of the meek. Because of those who choose to obey and to seek and follow his ways. Because more and more every single day the earth is not conducive of the ways of righteousness. It is indeed turning dark. And even now, many are giving themselves over to a different lifestyle. Enjoy the violence. Stepping right into pride. Pride is when it no longer matters what the facts are, what the truth is, what the Lord is saying. Pride is when a person believes they're right so much that they reject everything else. That's what pride is. That's what people are doing. This is going to cause the uprooting, the demise, a death cry we've never heard before. And they don't take it seriously. They think it's a joke, some wishful thinking, and they refuse to see. They know, but they refuse to see. They can make a change, but they're not going to make a change. They choose power. They choose their earthly stability over righteousness. 
and for many of them the fire will consume it all. They're opening up destruction upon themselves. Amongst them are the righteous and the humble. And if God does not intervene, then even the righteous and the humble would start thinking that the ways of the world are the true ways to follow. In other words, God will start losing people. In the absence of truth, all of us would follow a lie. It's when truth is made known, we make a choice. We were born into darkness, and from time to time, truth was shown to us. When we saw that truth, we wanted that truth. Only when we saw that truth. So how do you make a person in the world see the truth of what people are really doing? The consequences. If they don't see the consequences, how can they make a choice? How can anybody ever think something is bad? You know how many people are going to say within themselves, well, God wants me to destroy that person and that person. That's what they'll say. They will kill you and think that they doeth God a service. Isn't that what the Bible says? Yes, it is. So they will justify their own violence, hatred, rage, mix it with some good cause and say, this is what God wants. No, my friend. God will define exactly what he meant. And after he's finished, no one will make a mistake in the interpretation of what the Lord has put before us. Most importantly, those that are meek and humble, they will see the ways of the Lord and they will embrace them. All they need to do is see them. But in order for them to see it, they must see the consequences of evil, of hatred, of violence. These people are choosing not to handle things in a godly way. The border, for example, they're using humans to score political points. You do understand that, right? There's real death at the border. You do understand that. People are suffering and dying. You understand that. And you have people who are utilizing stories of humanity for their own position and power. How sick is that? In other words, they don't want a solution. You telling me they, they can't do anything about the border. Yet, now, just like Trump did back when he was president, our current president is seeking what? The powers to shut down the border by executive action. The same thing President Trump did when he was in office. And the courts struck it down. The courts said no. You do realize that, don't you? The court said no, you can't do that. The courts, listen to me, the courts struck it down. Courts did this. They struck it down. The president could not shut down the border because of the courts. If more of us would not mold what's happening in the world to use it for our own causes, more of us could see the truth of what's happening. My hope is that you guys understand why the consequences had to come. Look into it. See the truth of it. You guys have computers. You don't have to listen to somebody's speech about the border. Look at it yourselves. Don't listen to somebody's interpretation of the border. Don't do that. Because all they're going to spew is their idea of the border. See the border for yourselves. Not do somebody's speech. The darkness rising. It's altering everything. Our Father does not convey the penalty the consequences, darkness and sin, and even the righteous would be fully deceived. Remember what Jesus said? If he had not intervened, even the very elect would be deceived. Get yourselves ready. All of it's coming, all at one time. All that's based on God's mercy, but it's coming. The consequences are arriving. We'll be back in a few minutes right here at COT, and we'll begin our discussion. I'll be right back. Somebody asked, uh, are the consequences coming this year? They're coming now. They're on their way. Like a train that's not going to miss its schedule. They're on the way now. I see you guys as questions, but I want to point your attention to something. A massive heat bloom is opening up in the uh, Pacific Ocean. It's going to cause some bad problems. We also have a very thin atmosphere that will sweep Canada, the USA, Mexico, 
it will work its way and begin to consume the northern hemisphere. Hope you realize what that's going to cause. When our sun surprises us with a few overreaching, we're going to take a couple of hits, a couple of bad hits. We're going to take those hits. And you're right in the middle of it. When they start releasing, and they do get us, we're going to have a temperature increase. That's going to cause most things to become quite uncontrollable. That's why I said the conditions we have right now with the floods, it's a shame because people will, they will say, I wish we could have captured all the water. That's what they'll say. In the Bible, it speaks of a time when it says the living will envy the dead. Do you guys realize the time we're truly headed into? And do you realize the momentum of this time has been increasing, I mean exponentially, for many years now? And we've had warning after warning, but it seems people have made their choice. They're incredibly divisive. Most cannot hear past rhetoric. They can't. I give you an example. There are people in the world that will hate a person that they don't even know. There are people out there that will love a person they don't know. We've had so many occasions of people who were loved by others in the world. Then all of a sudden that person ends up murdering their entire family. And everybody was shocked. And the first thing they would say was, I don't see how a person like that could do this. It's because you did not know them. That's how. We tend to judge or to see a person in this world in a very odd way. The truth is, without spiritual insight, you don't know who a person is. You're being duped by their speech. If you guys, if a person has no spiritual sight, they have no idea who they're engaging with. It does not matter how nice or how evil a person may seem, you don't know who you're engaging with. I've seen people on the outside that they were, they seem pretty bad. I'm going to find out they were very just people. They were quite direct. I've seen good people who turned out to be murderers, unforgiving murderers. You know when a person snaps, you know when they say a person snaps, right? They, they snapped and they murdered their family, right? Think about something. Have you ever looked into a person who ever snapped and murdered their family? The Lord's word is clear. A person is drawn away and tempted of his own lusts. I've snapped plenty of times in my life. Murder was not a result of it. Nor was violence against another. I can never be accused of having any personal violence against another like that. Because I snapped? No. I can be accused of murder, I guess you could say. And that was from military service. Targets. As far as me personally snapping, where I would want to end another person and do it? No. You know why? Because when a person snaps, all that means is they stop covering up what they wanted to do the entire time. Listen to me carefully. We cover up who we really are. We pacify ourselves in any way we can to suppress what we really want to do. Do you hear me? It's like cursing. If cursing is not in your heart, you will not curse no matter what. If cursing is in your heart, you're going to curse. See, if you don't know the language of cursing, how can you curse? You will not do it. But if cursing is in your heart, it only takes a situation to bring it out. Do you guys understand? A person with violence and the more anger. Every day people suppress anger and violence. Or it's in them. They just suppress it. So long as their environment is okay, they can suppress it. They can act like they're the kindest person in the world. When everything starts going wrong, that's when they stop covering who they really are. And who they really are comes out. Now most people say, well, you just caught me on a bad day. No, nope, I caught you in a truthful moment. I caught you at a time when you no longer were preoccupied with covering up or suppressing all of what you have in you. That's why suppressing anger is no good. To purge yourself of anger is the solution, not to suppress it. 
Holding your tongue is foolish. Because if you hold your tongue, you deceive yourself. What do I mean by that? Many, I remember one time in COT, people had this phrase. They said, well, I'm holding my tongue because I'm trying not to. Nope, that's the wrong. That's not the answer. You have to purge those things within yourself. I do not have to hold my tongue. In the Bible, it says, out of the mouth flows the issues of the heart. If it's not in your heart, it's not going to come out of your mouth. If it's in your heart, it, it only takes condition to bring that forward. Do you all see that? To be purged of something is when it's no longer in your heart. That's why you don't ignore anger. You don't suppress anger and go on like, you know, nothing is bothering you. That's foolishness. All you're doing is delaying the inevitable. Just as a man is drawn away and tempted of his own lust. And what that means is nobody can tempt you to do anything that is not within you. I do not want to eat poison ivy. So there's nothing anybody can do on earth to tempt me to eat poison ivy. But there are certain groups of people who eat poison ivy. They have a ceremony. It includes poison oak and poison ivy. And if they're used to that ceremony, they can easily be tempted into partaking of eating poison ivy and poison oak. I cannot. It's not within me to do that. When you blow your top, somebody makes you mad. You retaliate against that person. The truth is that retaliation has been in your heart this entire time. And you never dealt with it. You just suppressed it. In the Bible, when the Lord is addressing Israel, he gave Israel through a prophet some words but he also taught us a valuable principle. He did. Oh, he taught us a valuable principle. If we would only apply that principle. If we would only apply it. He told us about a wound. He told us about walking around with a wound. The Lord did. If a person is wounded, he said they should have had some healing salve put on it. So I'm going to share with you guys a principle here real quick. I want you guys to see it so you understand why purging, especially in this time, in this day and age. Now listen, to purge something means you have to face. You're going to have to face what you have become comfortable with. You're going to have to face it. Now let me read this to you, if you guys don't mind, just bear with me. The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Azza, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. This is Isaiah chapter 1. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord hath spoken. I have nourished and bought up children. They have rebelled against me. The ox knoweth its owner, and the ass his master's crib. But Israel doth not know, my people doth not consider. Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They are gone away backward. Why should you be stricken any more? You will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick and the whole heart faint. From the soul, now Isaiah 1, 5 says what again? The whole head is sick and the heart is faint. That's when you give up. That's when you give in to the conditions around you. That's when you say, well, I try to have faith. I'm not going to do it anymore. That's when you have things festering in your heart. That's when your thoughts are jumbled up because of all the wounds you've been dealing with. That's when you're mentally overtaken by your own traumatic past. And we continue to read. From the sole of the foot even into the head, there, there is no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. You see that Isaiah 1, 6, from the sole of the foot, even unto the head, there is no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. Their minds always on, look what happened to me. They always have the sorrowful story of, look what happened to me. They rehearse the story of, look what happened to me. They tell everybody, look what happened to me. They wear it as a badge. Look what happened to me. And they're not healed of it because they continue to rehearse it. When you do that, 
you also begin to excuse yourself in certain behaviors because of your past. Well, if I had not gone through that, I probably wouldn't be so, you know, this condition these days. That's, that's not healing. That's a festering. As a consequence of it, the Lord says, what? What does he say? From the sole of the foot, even unto the head, there is no soundness in it. When you have wounds, you're not sound. You're not sober. When you have wounds, you do everything by those wounds. So I'll give you this example again. If a person is upset with another person, and they take up the Bible, and they start talking to a person about the Bible, they alter what's in the Word of God. Because what you begin to hear is advisements on that person who was hurt by another is going to go into this protection mode. That person is going to start telling you how you can't trust other people. That person is going to tell you how you need to protect yourself and guard yourself in this and the other. Why? Because they're speaking from a wounded position. To handle the word with a wound is dangerous. It's the very thing the Lord said do not do. We are to be of a sound mind. The Lord didn't give us a spirit has been damaged like that. We are the ones who by our own cultures and the approval of others keep the wounds we have and wear them as a badge like it gives us position among others. What it really does is it will squeeze the word out of you and no sober word will come out of your mouth. Heard this time and time again, it happens year to year. People speak by way of their own wounds People teach by way of their own wounds. It's not sober teaching. It's very dangerous. From the sole of the foot even unto the head, there is no soundness in it but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. Your country is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. Your land strangers devour in your presence. And it is desolate. as overthrown by strangers. And the daughter of Zion is left as a cottage in the vineyard, as a lodge in the garden of cucumbers, as a besieged city. Except the Lord of hosts had left unto us a very small remnant, we should have been as Sodom, and we should have been as Gomorrah. These are God's people. These are not some heathen making these words. You're hearing something from a compromised people at that time. This continues to happen throughout history. This is both in the past, it's right now, and it will be in the future. I'll continue to read. Hear the word of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom. Give ear unto the law of your God, ye people of Gomorrah. Why does Isaiah 110 sound like that? Hear the word of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom. Those who have position in the place where they're in, who has fallen from holiness, He's telling them to listen up. That means when you're in a place and you have become okay with everything around you, that you would smile and do all of what you do inside of an iniquitous place that does not bother you. And you even encourage others to be like yourselves. The Lord is saying, listen up, listen up. So Isaiah 110, hear the word of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom. He just said they should have been as Sodom. He just said they should have been as Gomorrah. Give ear unto the law of our God, ye people of Gomorrah. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord? The Lord says, why are you sacrificing to me? He says, I am full of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts. I delight not in the blood of bullocks, nor of lambs and of goats. Why would he reject their offering? I'll tell you why. An offering is something you give in place of your iniquities. Why in the world would they keep their way, their lifestyle, and sacrifice anything unto the living God? Sacrifice it for what? Because what they were doing was going through the motions. It's kind of like going to church on Sunday, and you know you're going to be back in the bar on Monday. What did you go to church on Sunday for? Is it helpful? No, it is not. The Lord is saying, why would you do that? Why? Why would you Commit something unto the Lord only to throw it away the next day purposely. Why? Why would the Lord accept that? That's right. Somebody said for sure. Also for self-appeasement. Also for social appeasement. 
also to fit in, in, in whatever group that you're in, to fit in that group. So it's not sincere to you, right? What purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord? I am full of your burnt offerings of rams and fat of fed beasts. I delight not in the blood of bullocks or in the lambs or of the goats. When ye come to appear before me, who hath required this at your hand to tread my courts? In other words, now they're coming before him. Listen to me. Listen to the language. They come before him, but they have sought no change. They've come before him as though they have a right. They have sought no change within themselves. They come before him, not having purged anything, kept all their wounds, and they're full of excuses. See, you won't go before the Lord when you know you're unclean like that, or you know you're not seeking to be clean. You will go before him if you have a bunch of excuses. Well, you know, I curse because of this. The Lord will understand. Well, I do this because of this. The Lord will understand. The person who does that is not seeking change. They want to stay who they are, and they demand that the Lord be some that they be a special case before the Lord No, That means they're not willing to purge themselves. They're not even looking within themselves. That's why the Lord bought up Sodom and Gomorrah and gave it to this prophet. That's exactly what happened in Sodom and Gomorrah. They kept their ways, their iniquitous ways, and would demand anything. See, the Lord says when you're involved in sin and you give place to it, you don't see it anymore. It becomes a normal part of your life. If you continue to do that, that's why he gives you over to a reprobate mind. When you think those things that are inconvenient, you'll think that they're right. You'll think it's okay to curse. You'll think it's okay to murder. You'll think it's okay to laugh at someone. You'll think it's okay to have anger against someone. You'll think it's okay to do those things you do. That's a reprobate mind. The year, this year, 2024, is a reprobate year. It seems like everything reprobate is coming forward. He said, bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons, the Sabbaths, the calling of the assemblies, I, can, I cannot away with it. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting. So now everything is tainted. Everything is tainted. Everything is tainted. In other words, he's saying, don't bring your traditions before me. There's no change in you. Stop going through the motions and bringing that before me as though I'm going to receive it because I'm not. Even that became a falsehood to go before the Lord with the falsehood. You guys see that? And that's a heart that is not seeking to change anything in it. It's seeking to cover, to appease something. It's kind of like I remember when I was younger, right? And when you're younger and you begin to explore the world, there are things you want to do. But if you knew about the Lord when you were younger, you also knew that certain things were out of bounds. So think of it as a person, right, who's already thinking about doing something out of bounds, but yet they go and pray. Now, they're already thinking about doing something out of bounds. They already got plans for it. But then, prior to that, doing that thing, they would go and pray. Now, is God going to accept that prayer when that person has fully accepted it? that they're going to go do this out-of-bounds thing. See, that that's the type of individual we have to be careful in not becoming, not being, or not continuing to be. People who say to themselves, well, this is the way I am, and this is the way it's going to be, and I'm not going to change for anybody. And then we start using the word to justify these unholy deeds that we want to commit. The Lord is saying, why are you bringing this before me? come before me with that because you know what happens when one person does it? somebody else does the same thing before you know it you got a bunch of people who refuse to change in accordance with the words of christ yet they go to the lord as though they're fully accepted and they teach others that you can be fully accepted and still have murder in your heart and still be full of vengeance where does it stem from where does it come from Anybody? It comes from what? It comes from those putrefying sores. It comes from bruises. That's where it comes from. Wounds, putrefying sores, and bruises. Unhealed areas of your life that you never dealt with. 
that you never bought before the Lord, that you kept, that you utilized to justify. See, you may not know this, but your past can be like ammunition. The world teaches you, hey, use your anger. Focus it against that foe and that foe and that foe. That's what the world teaches you. That's not what your father teaches you. That's what the world teaches. To use your anger to get yourself further in life. The world right now, this, this, for example, there are people, I'm not going to mention names, but there, there are people out there who were once prisoners of doing something very bad. Now they're paraded. And their deeds of murder have become a badge of power, a symbol of power, fame, fortune, all that stuff. So they sit as queens and kings, profiting from these wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. And then they teach others to do the same thing. And those who adopt those ways, those who stay with those ways, this is why the Father's going to, consequences must come. Because the Lord will break many out of that days they're in. When they see that the wages of sin is death, and that you can't mix it up in the way you want it to be, the wages of sin is death, when they see the truth of that, when they see the truth of those wounds and putrefying sores, when they see the truth of what they have been doing to everybody else, when they see that truth, if, if they have origins of our Father, they will return to Him fully. They will repent, they will return to Him fully, but the Lord must show them the truth of what they've been dealing with. Do you all see that? God operates in truth, not deceits, and so He will always end up showing us the truth of our own activities. Of our own ways, we refuse to give up. He will show us the truth. And when we see that truth, if we belong to him, that's the moment we say, no more of that. Lord, forgive me of that. No more of that. That's when we repent. And to repent is when we turn away from something, never going back to it again. That's when we truly repent. When a person repents of a sin, nothing can cause that person to go back to that thing. Nothing. Nothing can cause that person to go back to that sinful activity nothing when a person repents. There have been some things over the course of many things I've repented of. Nothing can cause me to do those things again. Nothing can. Nothing can. Because when you realize what it is, when you see it in truth, what it is, you want nothing to do with it. That's in the heart of somebody who loves the Lord, who chooses the Lord, and who clearly, right, God has given to a son. Now, for a person who is a tear, the tears of the world, the ones who are twice dead, fucked up, plows without water. These people who are ordained to be ungodly men, those spots in your feasts of charity, when they realize the truth of sin, they don't care. They'll still do it. They'll just navigate the world differently. They'll end up utilizing They'll also end up getting others entrapped by it. When a tear sees that sinful thing, they're charged up by it. They don't walk away from it. They replicate it. Everybody see that so far? Let me continue. He says, and when you spread your hands, this is Isaiah 115, when you spread your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Lord have mercy. That means you're guilty. If your hands are full of blood, you're guilty. That's when a person, I mean, when are you guilty in doing something? That's when you cause harm to another, whether it be direct or indirect, and you have no, no conviction behind your doings. You could find out that you hurt someone, and you would say, oh, well. I used to hear people say, well, I know they don't want to hear it, but I'm going to say it anyway. Well, what are you doing? If they don't want to hear it, and you say it anyway, they're not going to listen to you. And then they're going to watch for you, and you'll, you won't be able to speak to them again. People used to say they were outspoken. That's an admittance that you're going to speak your way, even if God says don't speak it. Being outspoken is, an, is a worldly term. That's not some badge. That's absolutely out of order. Why do I say that? I guarantee you this. If you don't want to hear from the living God, you're not going to hear from the living God. He's the creator of all things. There is no power higher than his. 
And if you do not want to hear from him, he will never be outspoken to you. The world is teaching people this ungodly way to be, and people have fully adopted these ways. And by force, they're trying to cause people to bend to their ideologies and wills. If anybody enters into the kingdom of God, they must choose it. There is no rule of force in what the Lord does. And I'll tell you something else. It's easy to voice your opinion. It is not so easy to be patient for someone, for anybody, and wait till they're ready to hear you. That's not so easy. That takes much more strength. It's easy to smack somebody back if they smack you. It is incredibly hard to hold your peace in accordance with righteousness, to love that person just as you would love yourself, to refuse to act on flesh, but to walk forward spiritually in truth. But the reward is great for those who choose the Lord's way. When you choose to walk by the Spirit, to walk by truth, the Lord will grant you the truth. You'll never speak to a stranger. You'll always know who you en you're engaging. The Lord will fight your battles for you. He does things for you. He continues. Almost done. He says, he says, wash you, make you clean, put away your evil. Put away the evil of your doings from before in mine eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widow. By the way, you guys see that? Judge the fatherless. I want you guys to see this real quick. Isaiah 117. Learn to do well, he says. Seek judgment, he says. He just said seek judgment. What is that? What is it to seek judgment? Hmm? What is that? Seek judgment. Somebody says, I'm sorry, Mike, it seems to me all of us followers of Yeshua being quiet is the reason the world is as it is. Nope, the Lord never said be quiet. The Lord said be ye holy, as I am holy. Being quiet is also suppressing, isn't it? Being loud is what? Violence. Loud's not going to do it either. It's not. Loud, see, because the Lord has a rule. Do not provoke your children to wrath. Right? If you go to someone and you're outspoken, you have no relationship with them, you're already in the wrong. You have no relationship. You can't correct a person you're not in relationship with. You cannot do, an, a, a show, do anything within love when you don't love the person, right? You can't do that. The Lord said, do all things as you would do unto him. The Lord also said, do all things with charity. So if you have no relationship of love, you have no business doing something to somebody else. No, Christians, it's not that they're being quiet. It's they think they're going to be ineffective. And many Christians do not believe in the living God. If I pray for something, if I do pray for something, I expect the Lord to do exactly in, in alignment with those prayers. Why? Because I do not pray according to my own will. That's why. I pray according to the Lord's, not mine own. See, many people have lost their faith in prayer because they feel their prayers are unanswered. Well, God's not going to answer my prayer, so I'm powerless. That's why people think they're powerless. If people believed in the Almighty, if they really believed, then all they would have to do is pray. And they would believe in that prayer and walk with confidence in the prayer. But that's not what they do because they don't believe that God is hearing them. They do not. That's why people feel, well, we got to do something. What do you mean you got to do something? You know how many times I hear Christians say the Lord's going to fight your battle for you? Even the Lord said he would do that. But see, he said he would do that if you're under his blessings. So what happens when we're under his cursings? He's not going to hear us. What one big problem is, no one wants to admit that, hey, I might be under his curses. I might be doing something in my life that I know I'm doing that I shouldn't. And I might be under his curses. We don't want to admit that we might have to make adjustments in our lives first. Why would the Lord heal the land? In fact, he has a promise over the righteous period. He said, if my people who are called by my name, if they were turned and seek his face, humble themselves and pray, turn and seek his face. He would heal the land, not us. He would do it. But what? what uh, let's look at the Christian community for real. What has happened? Division, number one. What else has happened? Everybody thinks they're right. I'll tell you right now, I do not think I'm right. I think God's right. 
And because I think God's right, I think all of us have been given a portion of that truth. And it takes us to get together collectively to, for the sake of that truth. See, the truth is never going to all rest in me. It's never going to all rest in you. It's going to rest in all of us. So then the truth is extracted. The truth is enabled. How? Through unification. It's almost like a safeguard on all those things that belong to the living God. We have to get together first, and it will come forward. But the world teaches, do it yourself. Many Christians believe, do it yourself. Well, the other person's not going to agree with me. Do it yourself. And they believe that because tares are among them. That's so division. I've heard people preach that God is, God divides people, this, that, and the other. Oh, my Lord, how mercy. They have lost their minds. They're not reading all the way. Remember when Jesus said, suppose I've come to make peace? No, he said about division, didn't he? I mean, they read that out of context. What did Jesus divide when he said he's going to break up the household? What did he divide? Can anybody tell me what he divided? I'll tell you. He divided darkness and light. He divided those who believe and those who don't believe. I'm telling you right now, there are lots of people in the church that do not believe in the living God. They're just going through the motions. Because if they believed in the living God, they would believe in prayer. They would pray without ceasing. How can we believe in the living God? How can we be taught about prayer and not do it and sit there and say we're powerless? See, we have to get ourselves together and quickly. And so I'll say it again. If the Lord does not give, if these consequences don't come, this hypnotized state we're in is not going to be broken. You see, I have all confidence that the Lord will not only break it, or he'll do a lot more than that. No, we're not going to like it, but it will be broken. Nobody likes to pull a scab off, do they? Because it hurts, right? This scab is coming off. It's coming off. It will not stay on. It's coming off. And the Lord is doing this because if he does not, we're going to be stuck like Chuck, still believing in these old ideologies, still giving room to all darkness, still saying that we don't make a difference, still believing that my one voice can't make a difference. I'll tell you something. My one voice can make a difference. We just have to get up and do it. The key to the body of Christ is unity. That's only one key. The master key is that Jesus is the head, not the body. The body is not the head. Jesus is the head. I'm not the head. The other person is not the head. We are willing elements of the body. We are not the head. Jesus is the head. And when Jesus speaks, the whole body gets the message. Not one or two. In unity, we go forward. We'll not go forward divided. Now, what do you see? All darkness and all evil and all violence and all this stuff. What is it doing? It's causing what? Division. But it's also doing something else. See, Jesus said he would separate the wheat and the tares. He would send the angels to gather up all the tares. First, the tares are going to be gathered. How are they going to be gathered? They're going to be clumped up into groups. They're going to be drawn together by these ideologies in the earth. You better be careful what you join yourself to these days. If it belongs to the world, I would abstain from it. That's just my advice. But they're being drawn together by these weird ideologies, and it's working. And when they all get together, they're going to be burned. Just letting you know that. They're going to be tossed right into the fire. That's before your face right now. The kingdom of the beast is nothing more than the assembly of all these groups that gather together. They're going to be put under one umbrella. It's called the kingdom of the beast. That's not for the righteous. Because the Lord said he would take the wheat and do what with it? Put it in his storehouse. You're being tucked away in the storehouse of the Most High. You're not being clumped together with the tares. No, no, no. The tares will be gathered together first. Burned. You have to witness that. Mm -hmm. The Lord is securing all of the wheat in his protected area. Why would he do that? Because he's going to burn the fields. That's why. He's going to burn the fields. Are you ready for that? He's going to burn up the fields. But you have to be protected first. He's not going to suffer you to be damaged. That's why everything had to be full-grown first. 
Everything had to be full grown because tares and wheat, they look like each other when they're young. And he told the, he, the guy said, well, you want me to go back? This evil person sowed seeds and which was Satan among the wheat. You want me to go and, you know, just uproot those? Seeds? No, don't touch them. Let them grow together. Wait till they're full grown, then harvest them. Why wait till they're full grown? He said, because you may damage the wheat. What does that mean for you and I? It means that if God punishes the tears and you see it, you'd be the first one to say, oh, that person was good. Oh, they didn't deserve that because you've already said that before. Looking in hindsight, you said, oops, that person wasn't as good as I thought they were. So if they mature, if they're full grown, then what they truly stand for is going to come out. You're going to hear it out of their own mouths. When you hear your favorite people mock the living God, when you hear them tout the sayings of Satan, the very sayings of Lucifer in the word of God you're going to hear come out of their mouths. When they cast your Lord down to the ground, it may break your heart, but at least you'll know exactly what they are. You have to know what they are. Because if you don't know what they are, you're going to say that good person died for nothing. And that good person died for nothing. That because you don't know. So when they're full grown, they will speak according to what's inside them. You're going to see this more and more. It is something no one's going to be able to override. This is what Jesus, I believe that Jesus meant when he said that those things spoken in secret are going to be shouted from the rooftops. Not that you're going to tell my secrets or I'm going to tell your secrets, but that you're going to tell your own secrets. And I will tell my own secrets that we'll become emboldened. We won't lie anymore. We're not going to cover up for what we really believe. We're going to start speaking as to what we really are. Everybody is going to speak their own truth. Everybody will. And when all is coming, it's starting already. If you just take note, people are doing it already. This is why people are coming out of the closets. Why? Because they're not hiding what's inside them anymore. This is why more people are coming forward, being those things that are shocking people. Why? Because they're disinterested in hiding what's within them. People are losing their power to lie. They're losing their power to cover up. They're losing all that power. When the Lord is near, no one will have a desire to lie. Didn't you see that in the word of God? That means everybody will speak their own truth. Everybody is going to demonstrate who they really are. Get yourselves ready because you don't know who is who until the Lord has that revealed. But I can already tell you, some of you are going to be deeply heartbroken. You will. Because we're so caught up in these processes of flesh, we can scarcely track those spiritual things that we are from. Just because a person is born by the same DNA as you does not mean they share the same spiritual origins. That's not what that means. The Lord teaches us the enemy is of your own household. I can, it's almost a guarantee that somebody in your household is appointed to cause a ruckus in your situation. You know that you, you guys remember Sesame Street? One of these one of these things doesn't belong here. Yeah. There we are. And when it's uncovered, well, it'll just be uncovered. But if the Lord does not do this, we're gonna be stuck in a perpetual wounded state. We won't see the truth. We won't be able to act on those things. We will self destruct. We'll never understand who we are. The moment you understand who you are. You'll never back away from darkness ever again, nor will you ever have fear another day of your life that you don't know who you are. You think you're tiny, teeny. You have no idea who you are. You don't. You have no idea of the authorities you have right now. You don't. Because if you did, you would not stand for this earth to be like it is. You wouldn't. Nor would you ever run from any danger. If that were ever to happen, all the devils would be in trouble in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. All of this would be over if you ever realized who you really were. Your identity is bound within Christ, and it will be revealed in his timing, not in ours, but in his. If he were to tell you early, the prophecies will not be fulfilled, because Satan will not wear out the saints of the Most High. 
There will be no dark kingdom rising. Everything dark would fall in one day. So one day that will come. Do you all see that? So as Christians, we're not being quiet. Many Christians don't know what to say. Many Christians find themselves alone. No. It's just that we need to actually begin to believe. My, my. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be wool. If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat, ye shall eat the good of the land. But if ye refuse and rebel, ye shall be devoured with the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Well, there it is. There it is. There it is. I don't know about you, right? I will not refuse. I'm not going to rebel. I won't. I choose the way of Christ. Whole way of Christ. All right, guys, I know you guys have questions. I want the questions when I come back. That was a good question. Do you know how many times nobody has asked that question? Right? The, you guys used to ask it in the beginning. Somebody said to me one time, they said, so are we to s just sit and do nothing? I love that question. I do. I love Because, see, that is right in the face of what we need to discuss. Because the truth is, how many of you know what to do to engage in this world? Honestly. How many know what to do? How many of you know how to effectively engage in the world? As soon as you start thinking about engaging, the first thing you think of is, oh, well, I can't do anything. No, what you're really saying, what you're really saying is you cannot approach the world the way you know how to approach the world. That's why people say, should, should we sit quiet? Why would a person ever say that? Because to not sit quiet is to do what? To be loud, to be forceful, to be direct, to be full of resolve, in, I mean, just right in front of somebody's face, right? But see, that's the way of the world. Your children of the kingdom, you cannot use these flawed weapons of the world to overcome things of the world. You've got to stand in your spiritual authorities because you are born again. You are not born again of flesh. That's not who you are. You are indeed spiritual. So stand up spiritually. You have weapons of warfare that can decimate the totality of the earth, but you'll never use them because you don't know you have them. Remember something, you cannot use the ways of something to defeat that something. That's okay for cartoons. No, the Lord has given you other things. It's time that you all discover those other things. And you can't even discover those until you first, first, ready to submit and surrender unto the most tied to his ways into the kingdom. So let me ask you this. Do you agree with what Jesus has stated, or do you not? It's that simple. Would you argue with the son of the living God? When he said somebody smacks you on the left cheek, you turn him to the right also? I do that all the time. Do any of you think I ever stand in a weakness? You have lost your minds if you think that. You have. You've lost it. But if somebody were to smack me on the left cheek, I will turn to them the right. I've seen people. I've seen, listen, I've seen people fight the way of the world. Look at the White House as a consequence of fighting with worldly weapons. Nothing is solved and everything is getting worse. See, there's an illusion that the world's weapons are going to work. But you should know by now they do not. There's an illusion that somebody makes a good decision, and now we have this way installed. Now we're going to get better. But you should know that somebody always steps in the power to undo the power of the first. What is that called? Madness. That's how the world operates. If any one president made all the right decisions, the next president would come and undo all those decisions. You should already know this. No one should be under any illusions as though a person is going to solve these problems. How long have we had? And it's not worked? Are you kidding? Let me ask you this. When you were a kid and your mom said they were going to fix dinner, did you eat or not? What if you had never eaten dinner, ever? But all you heard when you were growing up was, I'm going to fix dinner. But you never ate dinner at your house. Well, that means you need to examine those of the house and realize whatever they're employing, whatever tack they're using is not working. 
And if it has not worked since you were little, if they keep doing the same things today, you might want to expect the same exact results. See, when you're looking at everybody else and you say, well, they need to change. No, stop doing that. You who believe in Christ, stop looking at everybody like they need to change. God did not empower them. He empowered you. You need to change. You don't like the way your household is going, then you make the change. Not them. They can't make a change. They cannot make a change that's going to be effective. For you, that's never going to happen. You must change. See, all too often we're looking at everybody else like they need to change, like they need to make adjustments. Wrong. You need to make the adjustments. God gave you the authority. God put faith in you. God told you to call it forward. God told you to walk in it, to act on it. You're the one that needs to make the change. Not them. They don't know how to make a change. That would be effective for everybody. They do not. And every time they try, it gets worse and worse and worse. They fool you by making toys. Just because they can make a computer that works does not mean they're going to make the world work. They don't have that authority. You have that authority. That's what you're here for. We got to stop looking to the other people saying, okay, now we're going to get the right person that's going to fix it and begin to realize that's why you're put here on this earth. You're put here for change. You make the difference. We'll be right back in a few minutes right here at COT. Okay. Unfortunately, I'm back again. It's like war today, isn't it? Anybody uh, sense a problem spiritual? Anybody? Anybody sense a problem spiritual? There are some massive problems. All right, guys, I know you have questions. Yes. Ask away. Ask away. Ask away. I like questions. I can't volunteer too much. Some of you know that. But I will answer to the best of my ability. Somebody says, wait a minute. Somebody says, uh, let, me, let, me, let me get this one. Wait a minute. I'm on the job here. Let me get this copied and pasted. Okay, somebody asks, first question, Mike, would you please explain the verse in Isaiah 7, 15, 16. Butter and honey shall he eat. Okay, let me, because it, it, uh, it, uh, let, me, let me look up Isaiah 7, 15, 16. Let's go there real quick. Now, naturally, guys, sometimes, just so you know this, you, it requires an entire reading. To get to understand this, just, just explain that to you because context is very important. So this person says 15 and 16, let's read it. Butter and honey shall ye eat, that he may know to refuse the evil and choose good. For before the child shall know to refuse evil and choose good, the land that thou abhorrest shall be forsaken of both kings. Okay, here it is, here it is. At the beginning of this, he says, Moreover, the Lord spake against unto Azah, king, saying, Ask thee a sign of the Lord thy God. Ask it either in the depth or in the height above. But Azah said, I will not ask, neither will I tempt the Lord. And he said, Hear ye now, O house of David, it is a small thing for you to weary men. But will ye weary my God also? Therefore the Lord the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Butter and honey shall he eat, that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land that thou shalt abhorrest shall be forsaken of both her kings. The Lord shall bring upon thee and upon thy people and upon thy father's house the days that have not come from the day of Ephraim departed from Judah, even the king of Syria. And it shall come to pass in that day the Lord shall, shall hiss for the fly that is in the uttermost part of the rivers of Egypt, for the bee that is in it in the land of Syria. And they shall come and shall rest all of them in the desolate valleys, and in the holes of the rocks, and upon the thorns, and upon the bushes, and in the same, in the same day shall the Lord save, with a razor that is hired, namely, by them beyond the river, for, or, or I'm sorry, not for, by the king of Assyria, the head, the hair, and the feet, and it shall also consume the beard. It shall come to pass in that day that a man shall nourish a young cow and two sheep. It shall come to pass that th these are, these are prophecies that were fulfilled. 
And I want you to think about something in the coming, in the coming of these, these time marked individuals who came, right? One did eat butter and honey. Butter and honey also stands for something, right? What is butter and honey? Anybody know what butter and honey is? What did John the Baptist eat all the time? Did anybody know? What did John the Baptist nourish himself with? Anybody know? Anybody know? It's a theme here. Anybody know? Honey and locusts. That's right. Honey and locusts. Honey did. So then their diet, the diet was of a specific type, and it meant something, right? It's not the fact that he ate honey and locust, right? That's not the fact. Honey being part of it, that means something. Butter means something. Locust means something. And so in the context of this, yes, it's a prophecy. Yes, it was fulfilled. It was fulfilled, but it was also called something else, right? In fact, one of the phrases that we use came from that because it says that, you know, um, let's see, when you, they have little phrases like um, uh, possibly you may say, you know, this is, the, this is the bread and butter of this operation, right? This is the bread and butter of the operation. Same thing, same origins. They come from the same origins. That's why people use them that way, right? These things that they ate came from what? What do they represent? They represent a consistent thing. Honey is also, now Egypt said honey was food of the gods, and we're not talking about them. We're not talking about them. Wild honey is what John the Baptist ate. Right? Wild honey. He was raised on that. So he did not what? Indulge. He didn't indulge. So that means the upbringing was discipline. And he learned things of discipline. Discipline. He was not indulging. He was not raised with all these different tastes and spoiled with all these different things. Simple, disciplined upbringing, not to indulge in all this other stuff. When you don't indulge, you find out you don't need the indulgences. So when you find out you don't need all this extra stuff to indulge in, what are you actually learning? What are you learning? You're learning about how people, they do indulge in unnecessary things. That's what you learn. So when you find out things were unnecessary, but a lot of people do, what does it end up being as far as their character? Evil. It ends up being an evil thing. See that? An evil thing. And all this is part of the upbringings of all these, all these people from the beginning to the end. They were marked with this same type of anointing. They were marked like this with the exact same type of, anoint of an anointing. And before... Before Emmanuel came who? John the Baptist, right? He was the locust and wild honey guy, right? When Jesus came, of course, his nourishment, what did Jesus say? He said, You're, you, you, he said, you follow me because I fed you, but my meat is to do the will of my father. He wasn't a glutton. In fact, he wasn't anything that you could ever accuse a person of being. He did not overindulge. He did everything by necessity. He did. So that's a simple, it's just, it was actually more complicated than that. A little more complicated because it has more depth and meaning. But we have to look up, we have to read two other books to find that. You had to find the importance of honey. Number one, you have to find the importance of what the, what the, what the, let's say, salt of the earth is. And once you find that, once you find out that they had it, that becomes a blessing. Just like in your life. Your life was not too dissimilar. I'll tell you that right now. When you can buy your own food and everything else, people go out and they do things by what? Taste. Listen to me. They do things by taste. They don't do things by necessity. They do it by taste. They say, well, I don't have a taste for that. I don't have a taste for this. What do they end up doing? They end up indulging in those things they want. That develops a lifestyle of what, though? Of getting what you want all the time and even demanding what you want. Now, when you start doing this, you invite a darkness into your life. Competition, obstacles, all sorts of things. If you eat by, in a disciplined way, I'm telling you right now, you start to conquer. You start to conquer so many things, it's not funny. I'll give an example. I'll give an example. I had an experiment on myself. I can only do that. Right? For 
eight months. It's been about nine months now. Right? All I did was drink and sure to see how viable that product was. The same thing for eight months, no food at all. You know what happens when a person does that? Anybody? Now, I'm not endorsing it. I'm not doing that. I'm not endorsing it. I'm just telling you, I do weird things like that. When you have a taste for steak, but you're, it's another insure. When you have a taste for this, but it's another insure. When you want to eat this, but it's another insure, right? And the reason why I chose insure is because it held the nutrients. It wasn't a fast or anything. That's not what it was. It was to cut back on my taste buds all the way. When you eat a plain salting cracker, you just eat it. When I eat a plain salting cracker, I'm very thankful. When you taste water, you just, you know, get it to nourish your body or whatever. You throw the bottle away, you're good to go. When I drink water, I'm very thankful. Everything has a heightened taste to me now. Everything has a heightened taste. A, a real, somebody says lose weight. No, that doesn't mean you're going to lose weight. No, don't buy that for insure will not make you lose weight. So you can just throw that one out the window, right? When you do not indulge, you appreciate again. You start seeing the importance of different things. You also catch on the small things the Lord does. You do. You become incredibly thankful for the smallest of things. You do. And because you're not thinking about food all the time, you're not ruled nor governed by it. You start doing things out of necessity, not out of taste. And when you start living by necessity, that's when you become truly thankful for a lot. It's, it's almost like a continuous fast, right? It really is. When you do that, darkness will rear its head. You start to find out what temptation is. You, you're purged from temptation and everything else. Because I can't be tempted of a steak, a hamburger, fries, or anything else. I can't be tempted of that. Why? Because of discipline, because of a choice. Now the choices that I tend to make are solid choices. Better if they don't waver. So it's not, a, it's not even a temptation nor a big deal. For me not to have taste. If you get, if something were to happen to the food, right? If you can't get that favorite food you like, you can have a mental breakdown. It actually, in any indulgence, actually causes a weakness. It's like people set themselves up. They know uh, certain things are coming, right? And you can really set yourself up for, for a fall. That means you can lose your character over a hamburger because you can't get a hamburger. That's what it means. But when you back off of everything and you're appreciative, right? I could eat a cracker, a hamburger right now and be very appreciative, but I would not touch a hamburger for a long time. I would never indulge again in doing that, right? I wouldn't indulge because when you have indulgences, you start demanding more and more. When you stop indulging and then you eat by necessity, your, thank, your, your, your appreciation level goes way up. Everything goes way up. He goes, wait. Well, yeah. So that's where we are with that. Oh, by the way, there's only one type of insure that I found that I can drink. I cannot drink the rest of it. No way, Jose. I can't do it. It's only one type I can drink. One type is, is actually good. The rest may need to find another formula for. Right? That other stuff is no good. Actually, insure can make you gain weight. So don't think it can make you lose weight. It can actually make you gain weight. It is a meal supplement. It has everything in there. Right? And you can live by it. Pretty good, too. You can. You can live by it. So, anyway. Anyway. That's what you're getting into with these. With, that's why this, the, the, the um, uh, um, um, in some cases, it's milk and honey. You hear that mentioned. In some cases, you hear locust and honey. In some cases, you hear butter and honey. Bread, right? Uh, when you get into the bread, all these things have meaning. And when you start looking into the meaning, you start seeing Things that are in line with the obedience of the living God. For example, God supplies all of your needs according to his riches and glory. Your needs, not your wants, your needs. Think about something. He does supply all of your needs, but most of what people want, most of what people end up spending money on is a want, not a need. Think about that. God supplies your needs, but we're always asking for things we want. Now, if God supplies our needs, who determines what we need? The Lord does. We can't do that. Do you see how that works? The Lord can determine what we need. We can't determine what we need. We can only speculate. 
Now, medical sciences has bought man to a certain level, so in some cases, they can have an advisement on what they think they need. But in truth, God can God knows what we need. All we know is what we want. Our prayers, the nature of our prayers is for what we want. Sometimes we find it difficult to tell the difference between a need and a want, even in other people's lives, right? In my life, I often look into those small, simple things like that, but I apply it to everything. My prayer life, I used to pray, and I would have compassion upon a person and pray something about a person that I wanted. I don't do that anymore. I, I just don't do that anymore because I can see how that's just not going to work in, in the lifestyle I have right now. I can't. I want to pray in line with what the Lord is already achieving in somebody's life. I know I'm not the make or break element in somebody's life, but I want to compliment the work he already started in them. I want to be of use to him. So in order for me to be of use to the Lord's work, then I must learn what the Lord's work is and agree to assist in any way I can. But I cannot be moved by what I want for someone because what I want for someone may not work for that person. Do you see that? And I used to pray like that, like somehow I knew what a person needed. I don't know what a person needs. The Lord knows what a person needs. Now, there are times when I say, Lord, you know, I went through a harsh time and I went through something similar. Please have mercy upon them. Many of you will always hear that of me. A person will say, Mike, can you pray for uh, so-and-so? And there's sickness. And, but I won't pray that my will, that God somehow perform what I want for the person. I do pray that the Lord grant understanding for why they're in that predicament, right? That's what I pray for, because I found out something. If you had understanding as to why God is doing what he's doing, you no longer have a problem. Do you hear me? You don't have a problem. Say, for example, you're sick. You're real sick, but you don't know. You don't know why you're sick. You're going to say, Lord, please help me, heal me from this sickness. I can't deal with this, right? That's going to be your prayer. But suppose you said, Lord, please help me to understand why I'm sick. And the Lord shows you, hey, you're sick. Because if you get up and move and do anything right now, you're being pursued. It can cause your whole family to perish. So I give you a sickness to make you stay still so you wouldn't lose your place with me. Because you can easily be uh, bought off track. So just wait. But see, if you knew that, you would say, oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you for keeping me. So your worry, right, your anxieties would turn into thanks. You would understand why you're sick. Do you know I found that in a lot of cases, people do get sick because the Lord will keep them still. People don't know how to stay still. They don't know how to stay still. It's kind of like, I hate to pick on women again, but it's kind of like women. For some reason, women have something. I, I, I call it women timing. I do. It is the worst. Y'all have the worst timing ever. The work. Now, y'all make good decisions when it comes to the likes and dislikes of a person, but y'all have bad timing y'all you the timing y'all have is something's wrong with it yeah i mean it's wrong right it's wrong anyway a woman will sit there and she'll say oh i have to go somewhere right now what do you mean right now well let me just get this there right now but then 20 other people 20 other women did the same thing all of meet at an intersection now it's a big accident right that's why women always run into the wrong people in their local areas that's why women always end up in a place where they can overhear something of somebody's business. Because in truth, Satan is trying to get you. It's not to give you intel. It's to get you to gossip. So you end up showing up right when a person is talking about something. You know you shouldn't be, but you have to listen because it's like, you know, lifetime or something. And then you go spread that thing and that's an abomination to the most time. Bad timing. All you had to do was wait five minutes not operate off that impulse women know it they may not tell you gentlemen they but they operate off these impulses that are quite strong if they get an urge to get up and go do something try and stop them and watch what happens watch what happens so oh, no don't go yet wait five minutes they they will get you, you just started a fight you tell a woman to wait five minutes they're going to look at you like you've lost your mind you're just messing up their timing. They got to get there right away, right? That's just how it is. But it's, I, I find it is it, somewhat amusing. I know what it is. You can't tell the average person what that is. I know what it is. It's the same way a woman is tied intimately to the sun. 
The woman's, the, the body and the hormones and the triggering of certain hormones are tied directly to the sun. And it never fails. Every time women collectively have a similar complaint, a solar flare, every single time. Every single time. Every time a woman starts, they get in a certain emotional um, headspace, right? A CME, every single time. Every single time. Every time, never fails. They're intimate. And why are they tied to such things? Because they have to feel their environment. If they could not feel their environment, they would never be able to discern a baby. If they couldn't raise a baby, the bond wouldn't form and the earth would not be populated like it is now. So they have to have a physical insight into many things. But see, women, that's also why. You cannot, you cannot think about everything that enters into your head. You cannot do that. You do realize that you're a spiritual antenna from everything. I hope you know that. You're a spiritual antenna. Remember that. But you have to discern of what spirit it is with everything. You cannot trust nor take for granted anything that enters into your mind. You cannot do it. You can't do it. And never use what you have been exposed to to gossip because you're always going to be exposed to somebody else's business. Never use it to gossip. See, that was Eve's problem. Eve never questioned this. You know, if, if the average woman were back in the time of Eve, they would say, wait a minute. Wait a minute. First of all, what is this speaking into my head? That now I desire this tree that the Lord said don't touch. And it's good for food, and I'm thinking about it. That's why women always say, well, there's got to be something deeper. Stop doing that. Stop doing that. Stop doing that. That's the same way Eve was compromised. Same way. Why? Because she always wanted to know more. It was never enough for Eve for God to say, don't touch it. He gave them what she thought was a shallow reason. What did Satan do? He gave her the details. When a woman has the details, I'm telling you, ladies, you'll take those details. You'll begin to live by them, boast by them, operate by them until it takes you. God made you on purpose the way he made you. You're not made like your fellow man. You're made differently. You perceive things differently. You're wired up differently. And you have to be that way or the world dies. But don't take it for granted. Do that. All right. Anyway, this is a good question, by the way. Miss Angela, I'm a duck when she comes in. Somebody said it was Eva, hairdresser. What in the world? Only uh, one. The people of the world take that literally that we can defend ourselves. Let me see. Kennedy 7 said, Mike, let's see. Oops. The, the people of the world take that literally. Like we can't defend ourselves. You know what? Let me introduce you guys to something. Good question. Good comment. Good comment. And if you don't mind, Kennedy, I will expand on something. Because it, it, it conveys a mindset that we have. So the first truth we need to realize, you guys ready? We are concerned about what people think of us. Number one. So let's not say that we're not because we are. If we were not concerned about what other people think of us, you would go outside, ladies, and your hair would be on one side. Gentlemen, gentlemen, you'd be missing an eyebrow or something. You'd have toothpaste up the side of your face when you went out in public. So the truth is we are concerned about what people think of us. So let's not act like we're not, you know, that doesn't phase us because we're, we're in fact, that's one of the anxiety points of a Christian. Do you know that? Most Christians do not want to be seen, yet they want to be seen. Does that make sense to you all? How many can relate to that? Most of you do not want to be seen, but you want to be seen. Can you relate to that? In other words, because we are affected with how people see us, with what people think of us, there's a reason for that. You have to go back to the reasons. It's the same reason you came to Christ. You were exposed to the truth of humanity, the spirit and human beings. You were exposed to the truth of it. You got the raw end of the deal, right? When you got the raw end of the deal, you saw humanity in a different light, not necessarily in a, in a innocent light either. When that happened, 
you had to survive in the world. And so you both hide amongst the general populace, but you also stay and try to separate yourself from the general populace. There are things within the world you do desire, yet you don't desire the world. Right? Now with these internal contradictions, it causes greater anxieties. With an admittance that you do care what the world, how the world sees you, you can start to move on, right? Because it doesn't matter if the world perceives a weakness in us. It perceived a weakness in Christ, your Savior. It perceived a weakness in Jeremiah. The world perceived a weakness in King David. The world perceived a weakness in everybody God called. Remember that. Why? Because they cannot see the truth of the matter. It's important that you not walk around with weaknesses. The question is not how the world perceives you. The question is who you are. If you have a weakness, you're fearful in certain areas. Stop denying it like you're not, right? Yes, the Bible says God did not give us a spirit of fear. Well, he didn't give us a spirit of lying either. He didn't give us a spirit to sin either. But we were born into sin, and we did sin, and we're all sinners saved by grace. And all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. So do we have fear? You better believe it. We don't have to live by it, though. We have lots of things, but we don't have to live by it. So to face this, the, these simple things, is the beginning of a, of a truth walk, you could say. Once we start to face it, yes, I do have these issues still, right? You can begin to work on things. But denial only perpetuates a wounded condition. And we're not to have a wounded condition. So when you're in your prayers, in your, when you pray to the Lord, be totally open and honest with him. I mean totally open and honest. Never hide the shortcomings. Never hide the fact that you still have fear. Never hide the fact that you still like things you shouldn't like. Never hide that. But seek a resolve through Christ for them. Have, it, it, just talk to him like you would at a table. Address him as such. Right? Start working on these things. Start working on them. Because in my life, it doesn't matter how I'm perceived. It matters what I do for others. I care less how people see me. I do really care about how I see myself. There were so many years when I thought, right? I was tricking myself, fooling myself, put myself in a uh, mental place where I really did believe, right? That I saw myself as this, you know, I'm okay. But the truth was I was not okay. But I was trying to see myself like I was okay just so I could have some sort of peace, and the Lord showed me that's not the way to be. I have to go before him in truth. I have to operate in truth. Right? We get better at that as we practice that, as we enter into that. But that's what matters, is how you see you. Mm -hmm. How you see you. The world hates you. The spirit in the world hates you. The spirit of the world operates through people of the world. So any one of them will hate you. They're going to see you in any way that can move you in the wrong direction. It matters the way you see yourself. That's what matters. And if you perceive you have a weakness, take that to the most high. Search your mouth and what strength you are to carry. Because you don't have to walk in this world lacking anything you do not. You don't. We often keep these limitations in our lives because of our own denial. For the Messiah, in truth, we do. Somebody says, uh, um, can you tell us about Jupiter? We will. I will. I'll tell you guys all about Jupiter after we have our presentation on AI. No, I had to delay this weekend's things, the stuff this weekend. I had to get that delayed. I had to de delay that, right? Uh, the file structure, I, I put the files in a uniform file way. They were a bit too big for what we were trying to do, so I had to go back and break them down into smaller segments. No big deal, but I'll do it. And... uh then we'll be on the roll from that. Again, I'm going to write out, I wrote out something for the KD files. You guys just read that and, and try. Try to adhere to that. Try to adhere to that. The, the, the things that are found in the KD files, it's not to give you a bunch of facts. You can get that from all over the internet. No, this is to uh, give you a narrative. But I hope that truth of this narrative is, is something that will help you. In some cases, it will speak on a very deep level of things we have long forgotten, but that you have been exposed to. And I hope that provides healing in your life. Some places are eye-openers, involvement structures of government you may have never heard of before. All of it, by the way, is relevant because 
there's a force in this world you've been contending with that you don't know. You don't know what you've been contending with. Well, a lot of people, they know what they've been contending with. They just don't. It's very difficult to acknowledge. We live in a world where spiritual things are not, you know, just not something that you deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. But I'll tell you this. You live amongst other things that desire to have you. And if it were not for your Savior, you would wish you were dead every day of your life. How about that? And they really do believe, they think they know what evil is, they do not. They have no idea. They may know a designation, designation of evil, but they don't know what evil is. And I'm very thankful, because that can cause a person to go insane. And although many people say they want the truth, I'll tell you this, half the, many of the folks who say they want the truth, they do not want the truth. Listen to me. To know the truth is to know both darkness and light. That is the truth. The truth is never half the story. The truth is the whole story. And our Father is a, is a God of truth. He will put before us darkness and light. He will have us comprehended. Now, he does so on a level that does not drive us over the edge. Be thankful for that. Be thankful. Also, be thankful you have not found the answer to certain questions you would have in the world because you would not be able to live in peace any days of your life if you had knowledge of certain things. The truth can be extremely disturbing. It really can. Especially when you find that something knows your name, it knows where you are all the time, and it desires you. It just cannot get to you. It's biding its time. Especially when you understand what's happening to the animals. And then at some point, you know, all the mountain lions and things that we have that people just love to say they're going to turn on humanity. They're not dumb like you would think either. That means, well, you better hope none of them turn sour around you. Because we really don't have a defense, do we? Animals know where you are, and they're all around you all the time. But they're not allowed to breach certain barriers. Not yet, but that barrier is breaking. All right. Okay, folks. Somebody says uh Somebody says, "Why would I put, put the blankets over their heads when they're sleeping?" I used to do that. I used to put blanket over my head. Do you know why? You know why? But truth be told, truth be told, I didn't like to sleep that much. Every time I shut my eyes, it's like it was somewhere else. And I used to put the covers over my head so I did not have to see anything outside of my immediate area. That's a fact. That's a fact. Anybody ever do that? Right? Here, here's how I found out. Anybody have? Uh, Sleep paralysis. I have some advice for you. If you have sleep paralysis, get some of those uh, goggles. Listen to me. Get the goggles that, that they have cushion on one side. They're black. They're very light. They're very light, but they're for sleeping. Get some of those and put those over your face. And what that does is when you open your eyes, when your, uh, uh, your brain is kind of active, you open your eyes, you're not going to see a thing. So nothing can mess with you nor tempt you that way. And you'll sleep peacefully. For the most part, you won't have sleep paralysis anymore. You won't. Who knew? Huh? A lot of people put the covers over their heads for security reasons. I know I used to do it. I used to do it. We, all of us have different quirky stories. Uh, I don't, there's one thing I didn't mind, but what I did not like was the experience itself. I didn't like it. it was, for me, it was almost like shutting your eyes to go to sleep, then all of a sudden... You're in a different place. Your eyes are wide open. And you cannot unsee what you're seeing. And it wasn't silly stuff either. Early in life, I learned that things I would see would either end up happening or it'd be a situation I would face <clears throat> later on down the road. Prior to that time, I used to have these scary dreams and something was chasing me. Well, I got tired one time when I was a little kid and I turned around to see what was chasing me and decided I'm going to chase it back. And from that point, I never had a scary dream again. But then the nature of my dreams, they changed. There are stages in dreams you go through. All of you have had a dream where you've been running from something. And all of you probably stopped having that dream when you decided you were going to look back to see what was chasing you. There are levels of development that you go through, right? And all of that is necessary, believe it or not. I know it sounds weird, but your dreams are necessary. But you always have to weigh where your dreams are coming from. 
Some dreams, they reveal what you're still prone to do given certain situations. And those are those dreams where you wake up embarrassed and you say, oh, I'm so glad that was a dream and nobody saw that one because your choices were bad. It's not like you ran away from what you found yourself in the middle of. You know what I'm talking about. You didn't run away. You didn't. But you woke up and said, oh, boy, I'm glad nobody knows that one. Right? Dreams are necessary. Necessary. They're part of your growth. They're necessary. That's why a guy from the bushes like me would know certain things like that. I didn't go into detail. I'm not going to tell your secret or anything. Not doing that. And then they, after those dreams, they mutate into something. Now, those dreams come from time to time. Anytime you have those dreams, listen to me. I give you some instruction. Anytime you have a dream where you find yourself in something you didn't necessarily run away from, right? That's when you start working in that area. And you say, nope, I've got to get this thing out of me. The Lord is showing you what is still within you. And listen, you better be glad it happened in a dream and it wasn't in real life. The truth is, if you were ever put in that situation in real life, you'd respond the same way you did in that dream. So use it to purge. The Lord is showing you what you have a potential of doing. So use that to purge yourself of whatever that thing was so that you can overcome in that area. And after you overcome in that area more levels of dreams you'll have. There are, there are different levels of dreams that teach you in different ways. They do. They are necessary. They're quite necessary. They really are. So that means you're not getting them from your subconscious and stuff like that. Nope. Because all most of you guys share in a certain level of types of dreams. And they do escalate. And they're going somewhere. Right? The Lord is working with you in more ways than you can ever imagine. He is. He really is. So, there you are with that one. Now you know. As they say in the early 70s cartoons, knowing is half the battle, right? Also, have you guys noticed that those there's a specific bug that is coming up from the grounds all throughout the East Coast? Now, I will look further into this, but they're specifically coming from the East Coast. You know those, you guys know those bugs that have the pinchers on the, the, uh, the uh, thorax or whatever? They have the pinchers on them. They're coming up from deep within the earth. Not the male species. The male species is not coming up. It's the female species coming up. They're coming up everywhere, right? So, uh, and there are, let's see, there are like 50 or 60 different types of these species. To me, they're the nastiest looking bug I've ever seen in my life. I do not like their fat in the middle, right? They don't really do anything. But they're just nasty looking. I don't, I don't like the way they look. I do not like the way they look. I don't like the way they look. They're not centipedes, no. They have, like, pinchers on their butts. Right? They have pinchers on their butts. And um, they're coming up from deep within the earth. These are the females that are coming up. The females are coming up. They're coming up in droves. I believe that one of the local scientists on the East Coast said that they're coming up probably, he was doing it per household. And he said per household, they're coming up at about 150 per week per household. Lee Mayer would say they pinch. Sister Mayer, you stuck your finger right there where the pinchers were, did you? You just had to do it to see if they pinched. Don't worry, I did that too. I had to see what they did. But they're coming up everywhere. Now, what makes it so odd on the East Coast, right? You guys know about the cavernous system on the East Coast, right? So you may, normally you see maybe one or two on the ground. You normally don't see them in, in coming in your house, listen, there was a, there was a neighborhood um, on the East Coast and there were four or five houses and video was taken of it. The ground was moving. The ground was full of them. The ground was moving, right? And when the camera zoomed in, it was full of them, them. Then about, a, I think it was about a month later, uh, no, a week later, almost not a month, the, the, the uh, concrete, they were all over the concrete of this house, that the house had a footer. They were all over the concrete on the dark side, it's not the sun side, but the dark side. They were all over the concrete and all in the yard and all in the grass. Something is driving them. It's driving them big time. I just want you to know that they're not the only bug that's starting to come topside. They're not the only ones, right? So uh, I'm not a bug person. I'm not. Not a bug person. I respect everything God made. 
I do not like bugs. Just so you know that. I don't like bugs. But uh, as soon as I'm getting more than... <laughs> but they're, they're everywhere, though, they are. Something is driving insects to the surface. A lot of them. But one of my biggest questions was, have not been answered yet. How have they multiplied so fast? Would, would all of them just pop up like that? I mean, this is, that's like an invasion or something. What is driving these things up? They're coming in through every orifice of, that you can imagine. Right? So it says, did you see the fires starting in Australia this year? Australia will have fires this year. Yeah. Australia's had fires every year. But some of the more enormous fires will come with the driest of temperatures. Right? Get ready for that. Get ready. Get ready for that. Please get ready. Australia, what you can't really say Australia has, you know, gotten rid of all their fires either. It really, you can't say that. But some of the more massive fires will start right there when Australia has its season of fires. It will lead the way for everybody else. It will. That's at a specific time. This time, though, fires have already begun. They broke out in Canada. They broke out in California. They broke out in Texas. They broke out in some other spots. They're going to continue this way. Things are going to get kind of smoky for a lot of people. Plus, we have new volcanic activity. We have very dangerous uh, um, pressure places in the earth, right? We have surface deformation in a lot of areas. There's actual surface deformation that's being watched very closely. That means more things are about to blow. Based on what I believe, based on what Mexico and the USA decides, Mexico is a time bomb. I'll tell you this. If cruelty is a result of what happens between the USA and Mexico, well, there's enough uh, magma underneath them to destroy quite a bit. And if that goes, if California continues on their track, California is going to be in big trouble. And what track are they on? They're cultivating something they shouldn't cultivate. You would think it was the people breaking in and stealing stuff, right? That's not what bothers me. That's ignorant human activity. But when they get into spiritual things, increased, that will spread all throughout humanity. We'll see how that goes from there. Right? And Texas, you probably should not have let those companies come into Texas. I tell you right now, they will be the undoing of Texas. Because they carry something with them. They carry a declaration. And it's going to cause Texas to be an upside-down place. It does not pay for humanity to forget about their creator. Yet they continue to do so, don't they? Well, folks, with that, listen, I'm not going to hold you guys hostage. I'm going to say God bless everybody. I'm going to see you guys tomorrow. I'm going to get those KD files broken down where they actually fit in the chunks. We need them on the website. They were too big. One, one of the KD files was uh, 325. No, no, I'm sorry. 320. Yeah, it was 325 gigabytes. Or, or um, yeah, 325 gig. I think that's a little too big, right? That was too big. I don't know how they got so large, but it was that large. And so I had to do some strategic breakdowns of these things. I will more than likely copy them over to a different database. A different make a new database tonight, copy them over to a database, have them assembled on the web page on demand so that you guys can get them with all their components as you're reading. That way we don't have to load the whole document, but only the portion you're looking at for that moment. We're going to do it that way. So I had to delay that. I hope you guys don't mind, but I'm working on it. So I'm going to make some new, a new uh, SQL database, some SQL data tables, some Oracle data tables, and da 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 and get that stuff going for you, okay? Folks, God bless each of you. Remember something. Everything that's happening in this world is for those who believe in Christ. It really is. The Lord will deliver us. Don't mistake it for anything else. Nothing is against you. Nothing is. But be open and honest with the Savior. Always. Always. I'll see you guys another time. I've been emails. We'll have that in the making as soon as our, I get to reload our pop server tonight, too. For the eighth time. But we'll get that we'll get that done. God bless you guys. I'm gonna see you next time right here at COT. Actually, admins, when you receive uh, when you receive that email from me, do me a favor, put your requested passwords in there one more time, and then I'll go ahead and process everything from there, okay? So when you see that email, just do that for me. That'll work. God bless you guys. I'm gonna see you next time right here at COT.